Come on, let's give God praise. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. We praise you. We say that you are an awesome, mighty God. Yes. And we honor you. We welcome you. And more than anything, God, we serve you and we love you with all of our hearts, soul, mind, and strength. Yes. And if you love God and you feel the same way, the people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, this section did great. This section, uh, let me try it again. And the people said, yeah. All right, you caught up. So anyway, <laughs> it's good. But we were telling the first service this, you know, uh, I think the one section kind of outdid the other section. But, you know, how many remember those clap meters? Remember those clap meters, you know, for like applause and stuff like that? So it's good, you know, because why do you think it's sports that they have, you know, the little cue cards, you know, louder, you know? Because there's something that happens when we express ourselves, especially to God. I mean, understand that. It's it moves true. Him, but it does something in you. It's so. right. Yeah, it's a break. Well, how many of you are ready for the heat? All the, the weather coming up. You know, we've been having people riding on social media because the Lord prophesied way back, uh, first part of this year, that this would be a year that they would say would be in the hundreds. And that would be kind of what would um, define this, this summer. And, and God said it's because... Things are heating up, and His justice is going to be seen. So yes. how many of you noticed some of that, too? It's been very interesting. But I'm ready for fall. How many are ready for fall? I'm ready for football. I'm ready for That's for, all you're looking for. for. Fall, I know anyway. how you think. Well, we, uh, <laughs> we had a great, yesterday was our 34-year anniversary, Brenda. And we had a great time. Yes, we celebrate. And, uh, you know, it was, it was a great week. We kind of took a little bit of extra time, like we had mentioned last week, to just kind of, you know, kind of ease in back into the, the workforce, right? Yeah, and it's going to yeah. be a whale of a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we're going to be busy. <laughs> How many of you remember our pool that we showed last week? You know, the one that we... Uh, the dog pool. It's the dog pool. Well... That the dogs hate. <laughs> yep. And Brenda got sunburned from it. So. I did. Yeah. I did. I'm like, well, they won't get in. And then I... I tried to coax them over because I thought if I get in there and they looked at me like you're crazy right and then they would come and lick my ear and say get out of there please <laughs> well anyway I wanted to do this so to kind of depict a little bit about just our lives and, and our anniversary I just wanted to show you a couple pictures so let's show the one of Brenda this is a comic called Brenda's World Comics it kind of explains kind of you know what we do when we're not preaching Brenda notice how many plants she has in fact on vacation she went out did not go to the garden center yes you did come on Brenda <laughs> yes you did because I had to carry all of them in the house I how made many two trips two trips to the two, garden two center trips. two yep. I'm confessing my faults yep. then I had to go to Lowe's and get a bigger machete so I can keep getting to the coffee maker and chop the vines up but look at all the fish I mean Brenda how many aquariums do you have I have eight. Eight aquariums. The biggest is 120 gallons. Yep. And the smallest is four. Small, yeah. Four. Four gallons. Yep. There you go. With All one right. fish. One betta. And one betta. Which one is the better? The one up on the top? I guess. Yeah. Okay. Wow. But mine's not in a hanging bowl. And Brenda's very diligent. It's in a, it's in a, fish bowls are really bad, really. Actually, mine are better than that. But what she doesn't tell you is she grows these plants out of the aquarium. It's yes. really amazing. So it looks real. Everything looks really real. Everything is real. Well, that's what, yeah, it, it is real. It doesn't look real. It's real. <laughs> yeah. It's real. Get it okay. right. Okay. <laughs> like if, toy trains. They're real trains, Brenda. <laughs> All right, so let's look at, let, let's, let's look. <laughs> hey, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> stop. <laughs> We're not competitive about our own. No, we're not competitive. Let's just move on. So anyway, <laughs> so here's mine. So this is my world. With, and yeah. that's my world. Three ships. And uh, yeah, and then trains. And then if you notice, uh, Captain Zepto up at the top, which by the way, we've got great news. The video is done, done, done. And um, so we'll be releasing it. And we're working on five more stories that they take, they've taken from my comic books. God gave us a guy who is one of the writers, had been one of the writers for Veggie Tales, and uh, 
Also, he produced and wrote the movie Hoodwink. Tell me, remember that in the uh, in the uh, the cartoon there? So he's doing a great job of really taking the comic books and bringing them alive. So we got five more stories. Then, if you look at that picture, also you see way down on the bottom by the trains next to the dogs. That's a pig. That's my next series. I'm getting ready to release. It's called um, the P.I. Gus Detective at Large. <laughs> so. And that's the next series. So we're going to really, really give stuff for, for children. But that's our world. Amen? Amen. So you like All it, right. Brenda? I do. Okay. I do. So are you going to tell everybody what you preach yep. about? I'm going to greet those of you that are watching around the world. We're so honored. And I want to say this to those of you in this room, but also those of you that are watching. You put out the kindest, excuse me, the kindest, heartfelt, loving comments and uh, you are congratulating Brenda and I, and it really touched our heart, and we prayed for you. And I just want to say thank you for taking the time. I mean, just the fact that you would take the time and say, hey, guys, you know, we celebrate with you really meant a lot to, to us. But to, to answer your question, what I'm going to preach about is last week we talked about rehearsing your victories. We talked about the life of David. But today, Brenda, we're going to talk about the life and the journey of Israel and uh, what led them to have to go around the same old mountain 40 years and it's because they forgot they forgot to rehearse their victory so we're going to talk about avoiding certain things that will take us out of our destiny and our journey and um i think it's going to get us well right you were there. you were not fired up in the nine o'clock at all up. i'm just telling you so I'm just fired up. be ready you know don't even bother with the seatbelt because we're going to fly it's going to be good <laughs> hey, there you amen go. all, right. all right well you're in the right place today right all right Come on, I did this in the first service, so here's what I'm going to have you do. Turn and look at somebody and tell them you came to the right place. God's in this room. He's going to speak to you. Come on. He's going to touch your life. Come on, now tell somebody else. The supernatural is here. Man. There's miracles in this atmosphere. Come on, tell somebody. The anointing is here. And now throw your hands up to heaven and say, Lord. Lord, I know, I know. The, Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is in this room. In this room. My faith is on. I'm ready to receive everything that you have for me. Now, come on, I'm telling you, shout like you really believe that. And let's praise the Lord. Amen. Say his name, Jesus. Jesus. Yeshua. We worship you. Bless you. Our dependency is upon you and your greatness. And we honor you. We worship you. Oh, God, you are amazing. You are awesome. And we give thanks to you. But I want you just to think for a moment, and those of you that are watching, of all that God has done. Lord, we thank you for healing we thank you for wholeness in our life. We thank you for protection, preservation, rescue from harm, delivered from evil. Lord, prospered, blessed, strengthened. Lord, thank you for the soundness of mind that we have. Thank you, God, for guidance and wisdom and knowledge and understanding and revelation. Thank you for the spirit of might and power. Thank you, God, for boldness. Thank you for your blessing. And thank you for all the answered prayers. That it was not of our might and our power that could do it, but God, it was by you and the might of your gracious hand. We acknowledge you. We celebrate you. And we are grateful and thankful for you. Now, the reason I wanted to do that for a moment is to, it gives us some opportunity to rehearse our victories, but to thank God. But I feel today, and I felt it in the first service, and I feel it again, that there's some of you that you really need some kind of breakthrough or acceleration, that you need something to manifest that you've been believing God for, you've been trusting the Lord for, and those of you that are watching, if that's you, just raise your hand. Let me see how many hands. Look at this. And what I feel to tell you is this. I'm going to talk about Israel's journey, but I want to pray for you and those of you that are watching. Don't ever think that God doesn't care, even when you don't understand. How many of you heard me at the beginning of this, and those of you that maybe you just joined, I talked about how yesterday Brenda and I celebrated 34 years of marriage but 
Can I tell you, 34 years ago when we got married on July 22nd, 1989, after we went to our honeymoon down in Kansas City, we drove all the way to Fort Worth, Texas, Dallas, Texas, and I was going to interview for a position that had to do with a children's uh, cartoonist. And we got down to Dallas, Fort Worth. In those days, they didn't have Siri. They didn't have a map, you know, that you could really read and go 65, 70 miles an hour. And Dallas is created with Fort Worth and a circle. And when I tell you, we drove around on what you call side roads. That's what we did. We kept going on these off ramps and kept going around and around. And we were lost the whole day. We finally get to a hotel and we check into the hotel and we get up to the room after driving around the whole day we were so frustrated that it was so hot and the air conditioner didn't work in the hotel room it was a cheap hotel i think back in those days it was like 8.95 a night or something like that it was pretty bad and uh anyway that's probably all that we could afford but here's the thing the air conditioner was out so we went down and said hey listen we want to check out we're gonna find a new place well, that's great as long as you know where you're going. And we got lost again. And the bad thing is I went to check into the new hotel and realized I couldn't find my wallet and had to drive back an hour, not even knowing where it was at to try to find my wallet. I have a new wife. I feel like an absolute failure. We had gotten an argument over how to read a map and that she should know how to read a map. And she didn't read a map because on the way there to, to Dallas, Brenda, I said, Brenda, I need a break. I'm gonna take a nap. Just go straight. Got gasoline. She went straight, just like her new husband said, and I'm waking up to the sound of gravel on the side of my car. Now, here's the thing. You don't, you don't put gravel on the side of my car. And I said, Brenda, where are we at? She goes, I don't know. I'm just going straight. Well, I meant straight like get back on the interstate, not go down the farm road. And so we were, I don't know, 10 miles from Tijuana, Mexico or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> The, the point is, we, we started our journey of marriage pretty rough, you know, lost, confused, argued. And then if it got, it, it, it couldn't get any worse, it didn't work out where we were interviewing, we got lost, nothing happened. So we left Fort Worth and here's what we did. We said, we will never come back to this place again. We want nothing to do with Dallas. We want nothing to do with Fort Worth because we talked out of hurt frustration, negativity. And you know what? It almost cost us our destiny. Come on, how many watch Flashpoint? Where's Flashpoint at? Dallas. How many watch the Victory Network? Where's that located? Dallas. How many watch Daystar? We're on Victory. How many watch Daystar? We're on Daystar. Where's that located? We've been on 10 years. Dallas. Where's my uh, animator? Dallas. Where's our book publishing editor at? Dallas. I would have missed out on our whole destiny so this is why you've got to rehearse your victories and i said this to the church and lord i'm only repeating this again because i want people to learn we drove up to tulsa oklahoma it was raining we get into the hotel because everybody goes to tulsa if you're a minister and you don't know what to do in those days and i went into the the bathroom to pray and brenda heard me and i was so mad and i said jesus i'm so angry nothing is working out you're not listening to me I want to come up to heaven and rip your beard out. Listen, not smart. And Lord, you know I'm not proud of that statement. You know I feel horrible and even repeating it. Thank God my wife knocked on the door. She said, what did you say? I heard you. I'm like, you're not supposed to be listening to my prayers. She made me repent. Thank God for a good wife who helped save my life. Because <laughs> you don't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with God. Now, why am I saying all that? I want you to look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 21. We're going to pray for you. In fact, Pastor Brent, I'm going to have you pray. And we're going to ask God for his assistance. Notice this verse in verse 21. And those of you that are watching, I want you to look at verse 21. This is Daniel. He says, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel. Now, that means the angel Gabriel. It wasn't some man named Gabriel that showed up whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly what? Okay, what caused him to fly swiftly? The prayers. Don't ever think that God is not for you. When it does, and listen, I stand here 35 years later, look at the fruit of what God did in spite of my ridiculous not believing him 
trusting him and knowing what he was doing in our life. And I'm here to tell you, it may not look like it. You may be single today and think, God, man, I'm tired. I've tried everything. Listen, let God do it. Trust the Lord. And here's another thing. Rehearse your victories. Thank God for what he's already done. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that there's angelic assistance here today to accelerate. Because notice what it did. The angel flew swiftly. Do you mean to tell me that there's different levels? Yes. You can cause things to move quickly in the spirit. Why do you think the first miracle of Jesus is turning water into wine? Not so that people could just have wine, which God showed them that he's a lavish God, by the way. But he also wanted to show the acceleration that he was aged. Because God can accelerate anything. And I believe that there's an acceleration that is coming over you now. How many of you were here last week? And I say this to you that are watching. I'm making a point to make this point. God spoke and said, pray for Israel. How many of you remember that? Pray for who? Netanyahu. And so we stood over there. We prayed for Netanyahu. Do you know what the news was yesterday? Put up the, put up the thing. Prime Minister Netanyahu hospitalized for overnight pacemaker procedure. And they had to deputize the next guy in command. Don't ever think that you, when you pray, when you stand, and I want you to, to hear this, that your prayers are not being affected. We had no idea when we were standing here and you were praying with us together that a man over in Israel named Yetanyahu would have a situation five, six days later that would require divine intervention and protection. But you foreran it. I'm telling you, Brenda, Pastor Brenda, I want you to come and pray. And we're going to believe God that no matter what you're facing, what you're believing for, what you need a breakthrough for, what you need acceleration for, it's going to happen. And an angelic assistance is going to come. And just as we stood a week ago, and then we prayed, and five, how many days later? Seven days later. Look, look at what God does. I believe you're going to come back next Sunday and you're going to see something has shifted. How many believe that? All right, Pastor Brendan, would you mind praying? All right, come on, lift your hands. Father, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice and those that are online. We thank you, Father, that even as we stand in this room, this moment, this place of agreement, we stand here agreeing together for breakthrough. Father, we thank you. It's causing the angels, the angels of the Lord to move swiftly. So, Father, right now, we pray and we ask you to touch those that need a breakthrough in the area of divine physical healing, those that need healing in their emotions, those that need healing in relationships in their marriages father we pray right now for healing to descend upon the people in the name of Jesus and we say now the angels to bring healing are being commissioned they're being sent forth they're moving swift swiftly on behalf of the people of God now father for those that need financial breakthrough we pray right now in the name of Jesus that the angels are, that bring provision that have provision in their fists and with in their hands are moving swiftly on behalf of the people right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that even those that need a, a, a breakthrough with their children, Father, right now, in the name of the Lord, we pray, Father, that you would bring forth a breakthrough upon the children and upon the families, that prodigals will be turned back to God, that prodigals will come to themselves. Father, we pray that parents and children and sons and daughters would have relationships that are mended in the name of Jesus. And now, Father, let the angels move swiftly on behalf of the people. Father, all other needs, we pray right now in Jesus' name that, Father, Father, as we agree together as touching any one thing, it shall be done by our Father which is in heaven. And we stand firm in the faith and we believe, Father, that whatsoever things we desire when we pray, we believe we receive it. We believe that we have it. We believe it comes to pass. And the angels are moving swiftly on behalf of the people of God. We release the heavenly host that are the ministering spirits sent forth to minister on the behalf of your people the inheritance of the saints and father we thank you that angelic assistance is here it's not it's on the way but it's also here and it's moving and father we commit now to speak right to thank you to rehearse our victories and to see that you are moving in our midst in jesus mighty name hallelujah hallelujah come on give god thank you give god a thank you Give God a thank you. And while we're at it, let's 
just use our authority. Say this. Say, devil. I just need to remind you. You are underneath my feet. You are defeated. I command every operation, every demonic operation, cease right now. Desist right now. I command it to stop in the authority of Jesus' name. Get off my body. Get off my finances. Get off my family. Get away from my children. Get away from my parents. In the name of Jesus, I bind you in the name of the Lord. Come on now, shout for the victory one more time. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, that's the way. And just remember, you know, when you pray, remember, you have authority over the enemy. Use that. Use that. You pray to God, but then you turn around and command the devil to, to be reminded that he is a defeated foe. Because, you know, he'll be there telling you that, you know, this and that's going to happen, but you say no. And, you know, when those thoughts come against your mind, that's the enemy. And you just say, devil, no, I will refuse. In fact, I am not going to think on that. And can I tell you one of the best ways to get rid of junky thoughts that come in your head? Fear Make sure you smile at somebody. God likes a cheerful giver or those that even act like they're giving cheerfully. <laughs> no. All right. Well, I'm so excited to preach part two. And again, thank you for watching. Those of you that are watching around the world. And again, thank you so much for your kind comments and love towards this ministry, towards Brenda and I. And we are very, very grateful. I want to pick up where I Kind of left off last week, we talked about rehearsing your victories. We talked about the life of David. And uh, how many of you have been rehearsing your victories? Okay, seven of you. Then I better go ahead and get part two going here. But how many of us, it made, it's made a difference? Just to kind of go back and reflect. Well, you're going to see with Israel the importance of being people who rehearse your victories and most importantly, remember what God has done. So I want to start with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I want you to go there. This is kind of our text, and, and those of you today, as you're watching in your home or wherever you're, you might be watching by way of stream, the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, notice what it says in verse 16. It's not suggestive. It says, rejoice evermore. Now, how many of you, you've ever been in a trial or you've ever faced uh, not so good news or maybe a not so good situation? that uh, you find it maybe sometimes rejoicing about it is probably one of the last things on your mind. You ever been there before? I remember I told you this, you know, we just came off a of vacation, but several years ago we were going to go out of town on vacation. Our air conditioner went out. Well, I certainly didn't feel like rejoicing, and uh, I certainly got very mad, and thank God for a good wife for 34 years, Brenda. Pastor Brenda said, hey, we, we need to rejoice. And so we just began to worship God, and rather than focus on a broken uh, air conditioner and how hot it was getting in the house, we began to thank God that He would come through and that this need would be met. And you know, the Lord did it, and today we have something better than old dinosaur junk of an air conditioning unit. You know what I'm saying? So God is good, and so always remember that. Rejoice evermore. It takes attitude. It takes determination. Notice what it says next. Pray without ceasing. Now, how do you pray without ceasing? What that means is you keep your connection with God. You know, how many of you go throughout the day, and maybe to you it's you look down and you talk to God, or you look up, or you just talk to the Lord? How many of you do that throughout the day? And I want to encourage you because, as we mentioned last week, one of the greatest things that Jesus did as he was getting ready on the road to raise up Lazarus, his friend who had been dead, watch this, four days, the report on Lazarus was, by now he stinketh. Well, what do you think? I mean, you know, if a guy's been dead, I'm sure he, he smelled really, really bad. But here's the point. The Bible says before Jesus even did his miracle, it said he looked up and he said, Father, he lifted up his eyes. In other words, Jesus kept a constant communication with the Lord. And do you know why some people get discouraged? Because they don't keep that constant communication with God. And I challenge 
you, when you're at work, just take a few moments. Nobody needs to know what you're doing and just look up. And in your heart, you're lifting it up before the Lord. Last night, about 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, the wife and the sheps, the three shepherd uh, dogs, German shepherds are sleeping. You know, one was snoring actually. And uh, I, I just woke up wide awake and I just lifted my eyes without waking everybody up and just began to worship and honor God and thank Him for what He's doing. And it draws God to you. And he likes it, and he'll talk to you. Look at the next thing. In everything, oh, underline everything. We don't like that. That's not a cuss word. That is absolutely uh, what we need to do. In everything, give thanks. And, uh, you know, I mean, come on. You know, you get fired at your job. I got fired one time twice in like six months. One time I got fired from ministry, and then I went and got a job six months later and got fired from that. And I felt like a complete failure you know, I said, God, I'm a mess. I got fired from ministry. I got fired. And I was only like, what was I, like 24, Brenda, 25. I got fired from ministry. Then I got fired from secular work because um, I wouldn't drive the, the head people to a strip club. Um, and uh, I said, no, I'm not going to do that. I, I, I have greater principles. And uh, they didn't like it. And they fired me for insubordination. Well, so be it. You know, I'm glad. God saw it, and he liked that I took a stand. And so, you know, I felt like a failure, and, and I wasn't quick to give thanks. But it was the very thing that opened up the door on this journey that we are here today in Omaha, Nebraska, started a church, because we, we gave thanks. We didn't know how we were going to be in ministry, didn't know where our next meal was going to come from, but God raised up a businessman who literally for a year uh, this is back in, golly, 1990-something, Brenda, three, I think, where he paid us $3,000 a month and said, I want you to pray, I want you to study, I want you to go wherever God opens doors, and we're going to take care of your needs. $3,000 a month, over $3,000 a month, yeah, that he paid for a year, and full health benefits. And you know what triggered it is we chose to give thanks, and it always will bring you to a whole other level of blessing. All right, let's go to Psalm 34. I want to talk about David real quick. We talked about David last week. Now, Psalm 34 is a great psalm, and I would encourage you to memorize that. There's a lot of scriptures and verses in there in Psalm 34 that I have memorized, and I, I look at them every day. They're scriptures that I encourage you to look at every day because it'll build your faith. I look at, uh, at scriptures uh, about my covenant every day. Let me give you an example. I go to Psalm 103 and I put my physical eyeballs on Psalm 103 every single day because David said we're not to forget our benefits. Well, I put it before my eyes in the morning and I put it on, uh, before my eyes at night and I list out verse 1 through 7, my benefits. Okay, well, what are those benefits? Well, he forgives us of all iniquity. He heals us of every disease. He redeems our life from destruction. He crowns us with tender mercy and loving kindness. He satisfies our, our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagle. He executes righteousness and justice for all those that are oppressed. He casts my sins as far as the east is to the west. I mean, what, what more is there? So I make myself and my spirit and my soul and my physical body look at certain scriptures every single day that I know that I know that I know. I believe those scriptures 100% and more. Amen. And you should do the same. Amen. So, and, and, you know, don't try to have 500 of them. Just, you know, try to get, you know, a good five to ten that you know. Those are scriptures that you know, that you know, that you know, you believe them. You know it's a fact, Jack, all right? So look at Psalm 34, and this is a great, I challenge you to read this chapter. I will bless the Lord at all times. So if you want to be on the side of blessing, you have to make a conscious decision to include God in everything that you do. How many of you have ever prayed about something? And, uh, but it's the last thing that you do when you're in a trial. I've had a few times in my life where I've tried to figure things out. And then when it wasn't working out, and then when nothing seemed to be happening, uh, I went to God. And uh, I've had the Lord say to me, well, why didn't you just ask me in the first place? Why did you wait till now when you're frustrated, nothing worked out, 
And I thought, okay, well, thank you for the reminder, God. But it's true. I mean, have you ever done that before where you, you know, and, and we try everything. In fact, if you have my children's books, I wrote a book called Treehouse SSO with Mutsby and Milo. And they get stuck in a treehouse and nothing works out. It's a hilarious story. And then finally at the end, they decide to recite the 23rd Psalm because they think they're going to die. But the point is, <laughs> they finally went to God and they get rescued. We do the same thing in life. Come on. God's the last thing we think about. No, the Lord needs to be, bless the Lord at all times. He needs to be first. And I tell you, you will be more apt to put God first if you put God first every day. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So notice the next thing now. His praise shall continually be in where? My mouth. My mouth. So if you can keep your mouth right, you can keep your life right. Amen. How did God create things? He created things with his words. And then he saw results. Remember, in the beginning, God said, let there be light. And then what's the next verse? There was. Sometimes we are so wanting to see something yes. manifest. And the reason why it's not is because what, what is manifesting is what we're saying. The problem is it's the wrong thing. Nothing ever works out for me. I never can catch a break. Right? Have you ever done anything like that? Have you ever said anything like that before? So you've got to keep your mouth aligned. And then it says this, my soul shall make her boast in the Lord. One of the greatest challenges for us in our life here on the earth is to get a grip of our soul. Our soul is our mind, it's our will, and it's our emotions. And you're going to see in Israel's journey, one of the things that caused Israel to get off course is they couldn't get a hold of their soul. And because they couldn't get a hold of their mind and their will and their emotions, they got into fear, they got into discouragement, they got into complaining, they got into murmuring, and then they shook their fist and accused God. That is always a mistake. Never bring an indictment against God. Never even allow yourself to think that way. It is never God's fault. God is perfect. Jesus said it. He said the Father in heaven is perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. And everything that he does is for your good and for your benefit. And never forget that. So you got to get a grip on your soul. And I was telling the, the first church, how many have ever been horseback riding before? Anybody horseback ride? Okay, you horseback ride? Listen, we don't really have horses in Nebraska. We have, we have cows that they dress up like horses, and then they put them at those places where you learn how to ride a horse. But I decided to go to this one place, and it was a real horse. And I grew up watching, you know, I love John Wayne, you know, true grit and all that, you know. And so I thought I was John Wayne. I thought I knew how to handle a horse. And I hadn't even hardly been on a horse, not even one of those toy ones, you know. And so I get on this horse and, and, the, and the guy's talking, he's giving instructions on how to do things and I'm not listening, you know. Yeah, and the horse was kind of going, Brrr, I don't think that's what they do, but it kind of sounded like a horse, but he's making this noise and I could tell he was a little restless and I was restless and he could tell that I was restless and so I did the stupidest thing I wasn't paying attention and I kind of kicked the sides of the horse he took off like a thoroughbred just I mean it's like Brenda the first time she saw me 34 years ago she took off and began to pursue me and so so <laughs> no, she's looking at me like shut up so anyway this horse took off and the thing is I freaked out because, I mean, I'm like, and I dropped the reins. And the thing is heading right towards a tree branch. That thing wanted to saw my head off. And so, thank God, at the last moment, I jumped up, I spun around on the horse and began to ride him backwards. No, I didn't. I'm just making that up. It's a great cartoon. I saw it once. But anyway, what happened is the, the instructor came and he finally rode really fast and grabbed the reins just in time or... I don't know what would have happened. No horsing around, that's for sure. But the reason I say this to you is because the scripture says in Luke 21, in your patience, possess your soul. And it literally means sometimes with your mind. You can't let it get over into fear. You can't let it get over into anxiety. Sometimes with your emotions, you can't allow yourself to cry all the time. And feel bad and be depressed and be discouraged and want to quit and don't want to do anything and don't want to talk to anybody except you post on social media all the time. I had a guy tell me that to me one time. Oh, I don't want to talk to anybody. And they're all over social media. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. So you got to possess your soul just like that horse. You got to pull on the reins and say, no, I'm not going down that road. 
If you don't, you'll never win the victory. Now look at 1 Samuel 17, talking about Daniel. So David wrote that Psalm 34 that we just looked at. When he was running from King Saul, King Saul wanted to kill him after several attempts. And yet here David took out Goliath, and yet he's running from this king. And we go to 1 Samuel 17. This is when Goliath appeared. And David said unto Saul, because Saul said, man, how are you going to go take out this giant? What makes you qualified? And the thing that David did that is the precursor or important if you are going to win the Goliaths of your life. You know what they are? Remind yourself of what God has previously done for you. Amen. Yep. You know why some people never knock out their giant? They never cut its head off and get victories because they don't rehearse. Hey, wait a minute. There's pain in my body, you might say. But didn't God heal me once before, twice before, three times before? And if you can't remember, just know the fact that he healed you when Jesus said you were healed. You know, you got a bill staring you in the face, or you got a boss saying, hey, in two weeks we're going to cut your job off. Well, how is God going to provide? Wait a minute. Has he provided this far? And he put a scripture in there for every man and every woman. You know what he said to the women? He said, don't think about tomorrow what you're going to wear. That's for the women. And then he said to the men, he said, when it comes to tomorrow, don't be concerned about men. Let me hear you grunt what you're going to eat. <laughs> Listen, I'm the one every day that asks Brenda, what's for dinner? She never asks. I'm the hungry man. All right, there you go, see? But David said this, he goes, Saul, you know I'm going to take out that ugly giant? I'm going to take him out because I killed a lion and I killed a bear. Now, you know what lion attacks are? How many of you ever ha have had, you've been under attack of something in your life, and you know there's little fires, there's little indicators, you know, that, hey, something is off, something is trying to mess with me. And then, you know, it's obvious, it's loud, and then before you know it, boom, there's the attack. Well, you know what you have to do? You have to start recognizing when things are trying to mess with you, okay? The minute that cough comes on you, get off my body. You're not touching me, Right? Right? You get a little rash. No, get off of me. I don't care what it is. No, what we do, we don't attack it. We go to Dr. Google and look and see what, what it might be. And then Dr. Google, who's not a qualified doctor, convinces us that it's some kind of rare disease that only you and the earth have. And now what you did is you just pulled that thing from Dr. Google into your soul, and now it's manifesting uh, in your body. You have the, you have the, you have the, uh, the, I don't know, I can't think of anything. You have some kind of weird, uh, 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 something fungus. <laughs> I remember, Jonathan, if you're watching, my son Jonathan uh, years ago went out to Dr. Google and tried to figure out what was wrong with him. And he comes back to, he was 10, 10 years old, and he comes back and goes, Mom, I know what this is. And Pastor Brennan goes, what is it? He said, the internet tells me that I have osteoporosis. <laughs> He's 10 years old. Really? Okay, there you go. <laughs> so, you got to be careful what you read, what you search. <laughs> okay. John, I know you're a squirrel. I know you're watching, but that's what you did. All right, now look, the next one is a bear. Bears are these hibernating attacks. It's like, you know, we're getting ready to go on vacation. Next thing you know it, here comes our air conditioning unit out of nowhere that breaks. But you have victory over all of it. You have victory over the enemy, and you've got to learn how to rehearse your victories. Now, let's go to Israel. Look at Psalm 78, and I want you to see this, and I encourage you for your reminder. This week, read all of Psalm 78. I've been reading Psalm 78, and there's one verse that really hit me that God was really upset with Israel. At one point, he said, Israel, you are flattering me with your tongue, and you're lying with your lips. 
<laughs> That's pretty bad. And, and I got to thinking, oh my gosh, Lord, I never want to flatter you, God. And I never want to say I'm going to do something with my lips and I don't follow through. So it really kind of convicted me to kind of watch that. But look at verse 10. It says, this is talking about the children of Israel. They kept not the covenant of God and refused to walk in his word or his law. Now watch this. What led to their 40 years ultimately in the wilderness? Now, I'm going to show you very specific reasons, but really it comes down to this. They forgot his works. Okay, you know what works are? How many of you ever heard people say, I wonder where God is? Well, you're questioning his works. You're questioning if he's going to work for you. And when you talk about questioning his works, what you're doing is you're questioning what something would manifest in the natural. I haven't seen anything. I still have this bill. I still have this pain. I still have this symptom. I still have this boss. I still have this and this and this. And we look at things in the natural. But we forget his works. We forget how many times that he came through. I remember years ago, when, just before I was mar uh, married Brenda, back in 1989, in July 22nd, it was right around before uh, I went out for about three weeks and fasted and prayed in the hills in a tent. I wanted to be with God. I wanted to get some clarity. And before I went out for three weeks in a tent, I prayed in the church sanctuary and I was praying and I heard the Lord say something to me. He said, Hank, he said, I have to ask you a question. I said, okay. He said, why do you, he said this always. So if God says always, it means I must've been doing it. He said, why do you always pray about things that you can do in your own power? And I stopped and I said, you mean to tell me God, my list is things that I can do in my own power. And I stopped and I looked down my list. And I thought, yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I could figure this one out. He said, why don't you ask me for things that you need my hand and in intervention? And I took my faith to a whole nother level. Sometimes we forget his works. So we don't, we don't come to another level of faith. When you forget about when God met your need or when he came through for you and when he answered that prayer and he, he caused that loved one to, to be healed, delivered, or he called restoration among your family. We forget about those things. But here's the next thing. And they forgot his wonders. You know what the wonders are? This is where people in America are missing it right now. They look at things in the natural. Well, the gas prices. Well, the evil. Well, this one still hasn't been put in jail. They haven't gone to get Mo. You know, and, and we think that God isn't doing anything. And the very problem with Israel is after how many times did God manifest himself? Okay, have you ever hit a rock and water came out of it? What would you do if you were in a desert and Pastor Hank with a big long beard, <laughs> said, don't worry, congregation, I have the answer. And I grabbed a stick and I hit a rock and water came out. You would know that God moved, would you not? Yes. You would think that Israel would be like, wow, this is really powerful. Okay, say that we're now being pursued by a bunch of liberals and, and, and rhinos and they're chasing us. And now we're on a beach and all of a sudden I have this American flag in my hands. And I say, don't fear, people. God's going to make a day. This is American, new American version. And I hold up the flag, and God opens up the whole sea. And we walk across it. Would you think that was powerful? Would you question God after that? Now, I, I did say this to the Lord before. I said, God, I don't know if I would have. I don't know after seeing 10 miracles of you delivering Israel from Egypt with the plagues, opening the Red Sea, I would think that I wouldn't be among those that would complain. I don't think I would, but man, I'm just glad I didn't have to face that. But here's the point. They forgot his works and then watch this, his wonders. Here's what people are doing today. Wonders speak of what makes you wonder. It, 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 it talks about the supernatural intervention of God. People are looking too much at political uh, maneuvering. Military maneuvers, uh, uh, political candidates, elections, laws, bylaws, courts, Supreme Court. How is all this going to turn out? And we forget the supernatural component of God. 
Imagine how hopeless it looked when Daniel got thrown into a lion's den. It looked like he for sure would have been eaten. And they would have gone in to look for Daniel. And guess what? He would have been in their stomachs, the lion's stomachs. They didn't expect God to have a supernatural component. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in the fiery furnace and they turn it up seven times hotter, they didn't expect there to be a supernatural component of a fourth man appearing. And this is where we in America, listen to me, have to realize if we will pray, if we will trust God, we will continue to see divine intervention. But these people forgot God. They forgot his works. Look at another thing. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Look at verse 3. God says, take heed to yourself. And notice what he's telling you to watch over. And keep your soul diligently. What did I just talk about? Your mind, your will, and your emotions. He said, keep your soul. That's why Israel got discouraged. They didn't keep their soul. That's why they got into fear. They didn't keep their soul. That's why they complained with their mouth. They didn't keep their soul. If they would have kept their soul in line with God's works that he already did and his supernatural wonders, they wouldn't have wandered around 40 days and 40 nights. And how about this? You mean to tell me that you're doubting God when every morning he's providing breakfast? Yes. They're called manna wafers. And it was milk and, you know, bread from heaven. Every day, God provided their food. Every single day. Now, how about this, women? I know you probably don't like this because you guys like to shop. But they didn't have to shop. Their shoes never wore out. Their clothes never wore out. I mean, just the fact that the kids, as they're running up the rocks and running through the sand, they never ripped their clothes. It never wore out. There was a supernatural component of provision every morning to remind them that God is faithful. But none of that, what they were wearing was proof that God is supernaturally preserving and taking care of these people. How about this one? You get up every day and it's 118 degrees. Some of you, you're experiencing those temperatures and we're going to see it in Omaha next week, hundreds. But every day there just happens to be this cloud that appears to protect you from getting sunburned. And then at night, when you have to use the restroom in the middle of the desert, There just happens to be fire so that you don't go to the wrong place where there's scorpions and snakes. Do you all think that way? Okay, never mind. I just, just, that's what I think. You got to keep your soul diligently lest you forget the things which your eyes have seen. See, that's the problem. Have you ever seen God answer your prayers? Have you ever seen God do something in your life or in the life of somebody else? Then you have to put it in your heart. Because it says, lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. And it says, you got to teach it to your sons. So let's look at Israel's journey very quickly for the sake of time. The first thing we realize is that Israel was in bondage. Look at Exodus chapter 1. It says they were afflicted. They were grieved, the Egyptians, because of the children of Israel. And you got to remember, don't ever think for a moment that the government is your answer. Government assistance is your answer. They will always look for ways to get you to depend upon them, the government, so that then once you depend on them, they can control your freedoms. That's how socialism and communism took over Russia and all of, the, uh, of Europe in the days of, of when we saw the world wars. The Nazis, Hitler promised them all this stuff, and they, they, they went for it, hook, hook, line, and sinker. And the next thing you know it, took their freedoms away. And then marched them off to concentration camps. Be very careful. This is what Israel did. They handed their freedom to, to a socialistic government in Pharaoh. So you can read on in Exodus 1, they were slaves. They were under rigorous treatment. I mean, it was horrible. But God did something. Look at Exodus 3. In Exodus 3, we'll paraphrase it. God said, I am the Lord God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Why did God say that? This is very important for those of you that are believing God in your life and those of you that are believing God for your nation. 
You have to go back a chapter to Exodus chapter 2, and I want you to look at those verses. Because 400 years, the reason I believe it took 400 years for Israel, in verse 23 of Exodus 2, to finally realize, hey man, we've been in bondage 400 years. Notice what it says, and it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, that's Pharaoh, and the children of Israel sighed by the reason of their bondage. So they were really really under this communistic, socialistic, governmental empire of Egypt. They cried, and their cry came up to God by the reason of their bondage. Now look at what verse 24 says. This is very key. And God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant. Notice it said, who remembered? God. Why did God remember his covenant? It's called mercy. Mercy. Why did it not say that Israel remembered their covenant? Israel for 400 years accepted the loss of their freedoms. America, be careful when you're watching lamestream media pick and choose what they want to report. What they choose to leave out like laptops and Ukrainian funny business. And what, watch what they choose to focus on as a distraction instead. Watch, watch very carefully when you have censorship on social media, big tech, some of these companies that are trying to take your freedom of speech away. This is what God caused Israel for a long time to endure bondage. It's because they were so willing to give up their freedom. In fact, in Exodus 14, we're going to see when they're at the place of the Red Sea and it looked like that they were finished. Guess what they wanted to do? They wanted to sell their freedom. They wanted to let Pharaoh have them and their lives again and their children, their livestock, their wives, their families. They said, hey, we're going to go back to Egypt. They were willing to give up their freedoms so quickly. You know why I stood for that American flag when others were kneeling? Because I'm not willing to let a symbol that represents our freedom be thrown at the hands of those that want to use our symbols for something else. You know why I speak up and I say what I say? And I, for three years, have come almost every Tuesday night and done Flashpoint when I've got so much going on. is because I will not so easily give up my freedoms. I will fight for God and I will fight for this country and for God's people. But notice what God did. God was the one that remembered. If Israel would have just in their crying, see again, they couldn't get a hold of their soul. Finally, God steps in and goes, okay, it's been over 400 years. You all are forgetting, but I'm going to remember. And so God remembered Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and said, I have to act out of my mercy. Now go back to Exodus chapter 3 when God raises up Moses. Notice the first thing he says to him. He said, I am the God of what? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the God of covenant. When you're in a battle, when you're facing something, come on, when you have a financial need, you need to say, God, wait a minute, I'm in covenant with you. You are my father. And you said you would provide. You said you would meet all my need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. When you have sickness in your body, you need to remind God of your covenant and say, wait a minute, Jesus was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised for my iniquities. He took the punishment of my sin. It was upon him. And by those whips, those precious whips, I'm healed. Those stripes. You've got to put yourself in remembrance of your covenant. America, our founding forefathers in our history, those writers, they'll try to mess with your history. They do the very thing that the scripture says, don't remove the ancient landmarks of your father. That's why they're trying to make you think that some of the first settlers and pilgrims and founders of this country, you know, were racist and such because they want to change your history. They want to make you think different than what is truth. And we have to understand that there are men, and it's documented and penned in the papers of the founding of our great country, that men dedicated this country to Jesus. This is why, listen to me. This is, and I want to speak this to Gen Z, and I want to speak this to you millennials. It's what I said last week on Flashpoint Tuesday. And let me just say this, Pastor Gene, He's not endorsing a candidate. You need to go out and see his statement. 
He's not endorsing a candidate that is not of Judeo-Christian beliefs. What he's trying to wake up the Flashpoint army is those who are running and uh, uh, in the primary and what they stand for. Because here's what we have to understand. And I said it last week. It's not that I'm saying we shouldn't have primaries in America. I'm saying I question anyone. Why would you, on the Republican ticket, even be willing to run against 45. I think it's insensitive to 81 million voters who never felt like they got their constitutional right that Senator Cruz was asking. He said on January 6th, can we do what the Constitution says? Can we take 10 days and investigate it for the betterment of this country? And they didn't listen. Those Republicans rushed to certify the vote, including one who's running. And I question, you're being insensitive to others in this country who are feeling like there's something that is funny. And it's not just Republicans, but there's Democrats that feel like, wait a minute, there's something that's not adding up here. And we owe it. It's not about political parties. It's about election integrity. And I think right now, anyone that's running... Against 45, in my opinion, is showing their true colors. I'm not saying they shouldn't run. I'm not saying they don't have a constitutional right. I'm just questioning why are you running? And then here's what I question Gen Z and millennials. You want to put somebody who is talking all the same values and policies, they sound good, of President Trump. But you got to understand, I preached it on July 4th. This is what our faith is about as Christians, Judeo-Christians in our country. This is what we have to understand is not only the history of the God of the Old Testament and the New Testament, the God of Israel, is that he didn't like two things primarily. Number one, he didn't like sexual immorality. He didn't like man lying with man or women with women. He didn't like sexual perversion, adultery, fornication. He didn't like whoredoms. He didn't like lusts. And he would always come to his remnant to challenge them. Will they stand up against the perversions of their day? And he would test them. But if they would refuse that test... Guess what would happen? You can read it in the Roman Empire. You can read it with the Grecian Empire and other empires. You can read it in Israel's history. What brought them down was they became immoral. You look at the Grecian Empire. Look at all their statues and their Greek gods, how they're dressed. Their paintings and how they're portrayed. You can see how they were bent towards immorality. You can read about the Roman Empire just by Paul's letter in Romans chapter 1 where he talked about men lying with men. People, watch this, changing their image of the way they were created, either a male or female, after the other things of this world, paraphrase. And Paul went up to Rome and confronted Nero, wrote a letter to the remnant in Rome and said, come on, if you're not careful, God will turn you over and has turned them over. Watch this. In the wrath of his abandonment, God turned them over and abandoned them in his anger. What caused God in Exodus 32 to look at Moses and and when he had the Ten Commandments in his hands and say, Moses, come down. The people have what? Corrupted themselves. And they were rising up to play. They were having all kinds of uh, horrific party sexual freedom. And God was very angry. But I'm going to tell you the next thing. And listen to me, Gen Z. Listen to me, millennials. You can read it all through the book of Kings. You can read it all through the book of Chronicles. Any king that brought false gods and religion into their house called white or the kingdom God rejected them and ultimately rejected the nation I don't care how strong their policies are if you believe in the God of this Bible you have to understand Exodus 20 verse 5 in fact it was Wednesday morning After that flashpoint, I heard the voice of the Lord at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he he was so authoritative. And he said these words. He said, I am the Lord God. I am a jealous God. 
Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I said to God at 2 o'clock in the morning, I said, as your voice, I will say that to the people and remind them. It's why our country has been blessed. Whether the presidents have followed Jesus, no, they've been held to a standard. You're not bringing your idols into our country. Amen. You know what took out Solomon? The wisest king? He brought foreign idols into his garden. And I don't care how good someone's policies are and how good they sound. If they don't profess the name of Yeshua. Are you hearing me? Oh, well, Pastor Hank, I think you're being extreme. I, I can already see it. They're going to write their filth. Let them write. I love empowering you and tormenting you that you have to write. <laughs> yeah, the truth hurts, so keep writing and keep hurting. But here's the point. I'm not, I'm not calling someone out for the religion. What I'm saying is we will have a fight with God. We'll have a fight with God on our hands. And if you believe in the God of our Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, he didn't change from the Old Testament to the New Testament where now he just welcomes anything. Oh, if you want to call yourself a man and you're, you're a woman, oh, that's fine. If you're, a, if you're a man and you want to dress up like a woman in your imaginative world, uh, I will endorse. No, 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 no. That, no, it's the same, same. Old Testament, New Testament. There are things that God does not like that he hates, he's jealous about. And one of the things that he doesn't like, and it's why he blessed Jehoshaphat, because Jehoshaphat was a king that stood up and took out the false idols and brought Israel back to honoring the one true God. So America, be smarter than that, because it won't matter what the prophets prophesy if we now take on a fight with God over his jealousy. Dangerous. And no, they would not make a great vice president. We all here? Okay. Exodus 14. Look at what happens. Israel. God, we know the story. God opens the Red Sea. Look at verse 27. Through 31, God absolutely opens the Red Sea, and then he causes the Red Sea to close. And notice what he does in Exodus 14, verse 27. He absolutely caused the Egyptians to be overthrown in the midst of the sea. Look at verse 28. And the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea. And there remained not so much as one of them. Let me ask you this. When we, get, we, we sit there and we say, how much longer? Is anything going to get better? How many times are they going to keep getting away with their policies, their laws, their wickedness, their corruption, their sex trafficking, and the list goes on. Do you really think that God is somehow different? No. He's not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he's looking for with his church is to quit saying those things and recognize that there is something that is absolutely God, and, and it's, it's his very being. In fact, it's at the foundation, okay? So if you build a house, your house is only as good as your foundation. Your, your house is only as strong as your foundation. You know why God is perfect? You know why God can't be argued with? Because the foundation of what his supreme power, majesty, glory is built on, it's built upon something. It's called righteousness and justice. Yes. And when the church... If we would get in line and say, God, you are a God of righteousness and justice. We demand your righteousness. We demand your justice. If we will say that, it will be amazing how many people will be held accountable for what they've done. Now look at verse 31 on this point. Verse 31, Israel saw the great work, which who did? Notice it didn't mention Moses. Moses was a part. It said the work which the Lord did. And this is what we've got to do in America, in our lives. We've got to put our focus upon God, his supernatural invent, uh, intervention, and, and what the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord, believed the Lord, and his servant Moses. Now, look at what happens. Exodus 15, I want you to see this. So there's a praise party that breaks out. Verse 1, they began to sing unto the Lord. Look at verse 22, and uh, watch the time frame. From after God opens the Red Sea, gives a victory over Pharaoh and his army. Watch what happens after their three-day 
uh, revival camp meeting in the wilderness. Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. They went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days and found no water. Notice what they did. They began to complain. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters because they were bitter. Notice what they did, verse 24. They began to murmur. They had a heart murmur. They began to murmur from their heart. They began to complain. And I'm telling you as I close this message today, one of the things that will cause us to get off track and, and to cause us to wonder why aren't things quite working out is if we open our mouths and begin to go down the journey of complaining. Well, I'm single. I can't find anybody. Well, maybe you can't find anybody, but God can, and God does. In fact, he's the one that said to man, it's not good that you should be left alone. That wasn't Adam's idea. It was, it was God's. And that's why when, it's how women got their name, and you can't change that. Because I don't do that with some dude dressed up like a woman. But when Adam saw Eve, he goes, whoa, man. <laughs> That's how they got the name. Yeah. And the people murmured. Now, I want to show you this. Complaining. Let me just pull this out for you. Look at Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. Look at the danger of complaining. Numbers chapter 11, verse 1. This, this is really interesting. Numbers 11, verse 1. It says, and when the people complained, what did it do? How did God respond to their complaining? It displeased the Lord. The Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. Listen, when we complain, when we talk about all of the, the bad, the hurts, what's not working, we hurt God's heart. And his anger was kindled. Now, I want you to drop down to another verse there. I want you to look and think about this. How did Israel get into this, this problem? I want you to go to Numbers 14. And I want you to look at verse 20. Because Israel, they got into trouble. And how many of you ever heard the saying, God keeps score? Now, I'm not saying that like, you know, to make you so afraid of God. Like, he keeps score. I'm not talking about that he's taking a list and checking it twice to see if you're naughty or nice. I'm talking about there are certain things that God does watch. And I just told you, if we want the blessing of God on our nation, don't become woke and get into redefining of pronouns, right? Redefining genders. No, you stay with God because God will always test a culture by way of, will you go the way of immorality or morality? We are in that test now. Second thing he will do is, is say, okay, will you look to God as the one true and only God and know it's not the same God of the other false religions? And you have to know that. In fact, I remember one time I was talking to somebody and uh, they, 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 they were of this, this person that I was talking to was the, of the Hindu faith. And they said, but Pastor Hank, don't you know that it's all the same God? That's what we believe in Hinduism. And uh, what do you say? You know, it's like an elephant. You know, uh, if, 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 if you, you know, touch the trunk, it's, you know, it, it's an elephant, if, if, a, if a blind man did. And then if you touch his ears, it's, it's just a different part, but it's the same thing. It's an elephant. And if you were blindfolded and you touched the tail, you would say, oh, this is, a, this is an elephant tail. See, it's just a different part. It's just a different expression of the same God, the same elephant. I said, well, let me, let me correct you. You see, you said if I was blindfolded and I would grab the trunk and grab the ears, grab the tusks, I would, it would be the same thing. I said, but you know what? Here's what you don't understand. I don't need a blindfold because I once was blind, but now I see. And I know it is not the same God. And I began to explain. I said, if you can't answer the question, who is Jesus? And you can't define him according to scripture. And what Jesus said about himself, he wasn't just a nice prophet. He wasn't just a good man. He said, when Pilate said these words, he said, Pilate looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, you tell me plainly right now, are you the son of God? Are you the Christ? And you know what Jesus' answer was? The literal translation. He said, watch, you bet I am. They write it. I am. He said, you bet. And really he was saying it, I am. In other words, part of when he came to Moses, he said, Moses said, who are you? I am that I am. Jesus was saying, I am that same God when I appeared to Moses. I am. I am the am. I am that I am. I am the son of God, the true son of God. 
the only true son of God. I am deity is what he was saying. And you know what? That's why Pilate said, you know I have power to crucify you. And Jesus said, I have, you have no power unless my God in heaven gave it to you. And you know what Pilate did? By the time he got done with, you bet I am, to you have no power, Pilate said, I don't want anything to do with this dude. That's who our Jesus is. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Now look here. And then the Lord said, I pardoned them according to your word. But truly as I live and all as the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, none of the men who have seen my glory and my signs that I did in Egypt and in the wilderness. And yet they put me to the test. How many times? Ten times. God put them, <laughs> counted how many times they complained. And, and I found ten different examples. I'm not going to read them all, but you can find it. It was at the Red Sea. It was at the waters of Marah, the desert of Sin. Uh, it was at Rephidim. It was at Mount Sinai. It was at uh, different places. There was 10 different times that they complained and God was keeping score. So if we want to be effective with the Lord, don't get caught up in complaining. Amen? All right, let's go on to the next one as Pastor Doug gets ready to come. Look at Exodus 16, verse 1 through 2. This is another one. In Exodus 16, 1 through 2, now they're in a place where they took their journey from Elam. And all the congregation of the children of Israel came up to the wilderness of sin. And notice it was on the 15th day of the what? So two months had passed since they left Egypt. So not only three days later they're complaining, now two months later they're complaining. And notice what their complaint was. Look at verse 2. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel began to complain. These are the same people that saw God do how many different supernatural feats? How many would agree? All right, let's look at another one. Look at Numbers chapter 21. Here's a second thing or another thing you could add. And I watch this with people. It's, I, I've had people, they, they say this to me when, when I'm out walking my dogs or whatever. They, they say, well, you know, I'm not so sure I'm going to vote in 2024 because, you know, look at what happened the first time. And, and I want to say, you have a quit spirit on you. Yeah. Don't have a quit spirit. And this is what this word means. Watch this. I'm going to show you the word discouraged. When they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, and notice, watch your soul, notice what happened to these people? The soul of the people, their mind, their will, and their emotion were what? Discouraged, discouraged because of the way. Come on, some of you are discouraged because of the way things have been since 2020 and before. And I know people that want to quit. They're talking quit. Well, America's finished. What's the use? Are you kidding me? I don't go show up for Flashpoint every Tuesday and haven't missed very many shows because I don't have anything else to do in life. I do it because I'm not going to allow you to become discouraged. And you need somebody that's fighting with you, standing for you and with you. But that word discouraged in the Hebrew literally means to quit. And I watch people, they quit. You know what? I, I had people in my neighborhood that quit flying their American flags. Veterans. And I went up to them, I said, what did you even, when, when you gave your oath to God and country, didn't you pledge a certain allegiance to this country and to its constitution and you can't wave your flag? They said, well, we're afraid. I said, what are you afraid of? You are willing to sign up and have bullets potentially flying at you and you're afraid? I, I, I don't get it. Now, I walk by their houses and they, they don't just have American flags, they've got Trump. <laughs> so, anyway, I just thought that was kind of good. But you got to watch discouragement. All right. Let me show you another one. Go back to Numbers chapter 14. We're going to close with this. You got to be careful of this one. Numbers chapter 14. I, I just thought this part was kind of cute. Uh, Numbers 14. Maybe you don't think so, but um, let's see. Where does it say? I think it's in verse. Talk about the garlic and onions. Where is that? Is that Numbers 11 or 14? Is that 11? Let me see if it's... Yeah, Numbers 11. Let's go back there. Remember? Okay. Yeah, it's Numbers 11. This is the last verse. You can go ahead and stand your feet, please. <laughs> so, remember verse 1. And the people complain. So, they're, here they're complaining. Now, watch what they're, they're trying to justify with God. How many have ever done that? When you offer a complaint, you're, 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 you know, 
you, you're mad about something or you're upset and you want to justify it with God. Have you ever done that before? Or justify why you think he should answer or that he hasn't answered. I've done that before with them. So notice what they say. And I just gave you the verse. I think it's verse uh, six. Maybe it talks about garlic. Five, verse five. Thank you. I took my glasses off and I'm not sure what it says. It's all Greek or, oh, it's all Hebrew to me in the Old Testament. Okay, we remember the fish which we did eat freely. They were slaves. Do you really think they had that much freedom? And the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlics. So notice they finished with the onions and the garlics. They wanted to go back and have onions and garlic over milk and honey. Now, let me ask you a question. I know the supplements that are out with garlic and it's the wonder and all that. But that's before they discovered that it's a great supplement, right? And they marketed it 4,000 years later. But what would you rather have? Would you rather have milk and honey? Or would you rather have garlic and onions? I'd rather have milk and honey. Because what God was trying to say, milk speaks of provision. Honey speaks of you're going to really enjoy it, honey, with your honey. It's going to be sweet. So you're going to have provision, and it's going to be sweet with milk and honey. And they chose garlic and onions. Now, here, here's the thing. I, I'm mostly Italian, and I love garlic. How many love garlic? All right. Now, here's what the rule is. If I eat garlic, my wife must eat garlic. Right? Amen? 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 Amen. I got one amen out here. You, you cannot be unequally yoked when it comes to garlic. Because you all act like you don't live. Do you, do you all live like? You're right. You don't, you don't go to kiss your wife. You got garlic breath. Okay, well, honey, you better take some garlic because I'm going to kiss you. Right? So what does garlic do? It tastes good initially. But eventually, it puts a bad taste in your mouth. Right? You get bad breath. So if you're going to both, you both better have garlic. It's just, if you're single today, I'm giving you a marriage tip. <laughs> okay. So, so here they are wanting to go back to garlic, which might have seemed good at the time, but they didn't realize, wait a minute, that garlic also put a bad taste in our mouth. We were still subject to government control and bondage under Pharaoh. Now, what about onions? Now, sometimes I'm trying to be the champion in my house. The, what do they call it, Brenda? Sous chef? Yeah. yeah, you know, we're the guy that kind of helps out the chef. And so she's like, well, would you cut these onions up? Sure, 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 I'll cut these onions up. <laughs> Brenda, I can't even see the onion anymore, you know? My eyes are turning red, water's coming out. How many of you men can feel that? I don't know, women have this, this built-in deal where they can cut onions and they don't cry. Contact. It's called what? Oh, it's called contact. So, so why do you, here's my question. I'm going to leave you guys with this profound thought. And those of you that are watching, wouldn't you rather have milk and honey rather than something that ultimately you think tastes good, but it leaves a bad taste in your mouth? Too many people are not rehearsing their victories because they're going back to things that really, if you look at it, that relationship put a bad taste in your mouth. Right? That decision put a bad taste in your mouth. Being around that person put a bad taste in your mouth. Don't go back to it. It's called garlic. But then why do you go back to things that hurt you and made you cry? Vexed your soul. Hurt your soul. And that's what happens when you start complaining. You get into a place of discouragement. You get into a place where you forget to rehearse your victories. We, we wind up settling back for something that we thought was good. Listen, I know people that leave churches. And they go back to the world. That's called you're going back to garlic and onions. Right? Don't let the hurt of a pastor or somebody else make you go back to garlic and onions of the world. I would never, ever do that in a million years. Watch online somewhere, but don't, don't be without a church and without a pastor. Amen. Pastor Doug, I'm going to turn over to you. We're going to get these people out at a good time. And I'm going to go get some garlic and onions and then have uh, 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 some milk and honey for dessert tonight. <laughs>
<laughs> All right, Pastor, let's go. I pray you are blessed. Hey, I got to say this real quick. Come on. So Tuesday night will be Flashpoint, but I want you to come Wednesday because we're starting a new Wednesday night uh, series, and I want you to hear this that are watching we're going to do a prophetic school we're going to talk about prophecy what is prophecy what is a prophet what is not a prophet what is true prophet false prophet wrong prophet how do you judge prophecy we're just going to go through all of it and we're just going to just throw as much stuff as we can out so that we can get more uh understanding of the prophetic so we're going to start that this wednesday we're going to have some fun with that so that'll be we'll great see you wednesday yes. night as well god bless you give pastor her hand How many of you are going to rehearse your victories through this week? Amen. Amen. And then you'll come back in the house on Wednesday night in uh, prophetic school. It's going to be a great week, and uh, we're looking forward to that. So let's do this before you depart today. Um, I wanted to share a scripture that I talked about a little bit at first service this morning. And it's where Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, he made a statement that's hard for some people to understand. He said, whoever will lose his life for my sake will find it. And I talked about that a little bit because sometimes we can get so independent in our lives seeking the things of this world that we don't want to feel like we could ever give up control. But Lord, I want to do it my way. But Jesus made that statement there for a purpose because he said, if we don't give up our life, lose our life here, we can't gain what he's offering us. And that's because sin became the thing that divided us, separated us from God. Jesus came to redeem us from that curse and allow us the freedom to choose him so that we could have not only abundant life while we're on this earth, but have eternal life with Him. And that's what we all want. We don't want to end up going through this life being independent of God, thinking that we're serving Him in a religious way, but never having a relationship with Him, and then end up going to an eternal hell or separation from God. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about hell. That's eternal separation from God. It was never created for children of God, for for mankind it was created for the devil but people choose to go to hell because they don't make the right decision they don't choose to serve God and I would rather make this choice while we have time on this earth to be serving God hundred percent here and then faithfully make it on to heaven on the other side and we never know how much time we're gonna have left I was just reading about someone that was driving along thinking they were going somewhere and they ended up in a tragic car accident that took their life quickly. Don't let that be you today. That something happens suddenly in your life that you would be taken out. Because the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die. And then the judgment. We all, unless the Lord comes before we leave this earth and raptures us out of here in the future, it's appointed that we will die. You don't have to be old to die. You don't have to be sick to die. But you have to be ready. That's what the, the Bible tells us. Be ready. And it doesn't mean you're ready because you attend church faithfully, because you shake the preacher's hand, because you occasionally listen to gospel music or whatever it is. Those things won't get you there. It's only the relationship you have with Jesus. Bow your head with me today, if you would. And I want to ask you a question today, and I want you to examine your heart today and make sure that you're 100% ready if you were to leave this earth. Are you ready to meet Jesus? Could you stand before a holy God and say, hey, I'm ready to meet him because Jesus has forgiven me for any sin in my life, and I'm able to stand clean, not because of something you've done, but because you have that relationship. And that relationship starts just with a prayer. It's a simple prayer of faith. You accepting what he's done and then walking it out as you progress in this life. And if that's you today and you say, Pastor Doug, I want prayer. I want to make sure that I'm on my way to heaven. I want to have the abundant life that you talked about. I want to live with prosperity. I want to live with the ability to have healing in my life. I want all the benefits of salvation. It's a package of benefits that you get. 
plus eternal life. If that's you, when I count to three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're watching online today and that's you, you can raise your hand just as a signal to God. He'll see you right where you're at, in your apartment, in your home, wherever you're at, in a hotel room. He'll see you and you can pray right there. And if that's you today, when I count to three, raise your hand. We're going to make it right. Before you leave this place, you'll have made a decision that will change your life to walk with God. Don't worry about what people think. That has nothing to do with it. It's only important what God thinks. One, two, three. Raise your hand right now if you need prayer. I see one in the back here. Who else? One over here. I see another one here, I believe, in three or four. I'm going to have the ushers make way for you, and I'm going to ask you to do something bold today and come forward right now. Get out of your seat and come forward. When Jesus called people, he called them publicly. I don't know why, but it, there's something about when you make a public confession in front of others, it's more solid. You know the time that you did it and the place that you did it. You'll always remember that. And it'll be something that God will use to change your heart and put you on the right track. Come on up, young lady. I appreciate you so much. Come on up, guys. I appreciate you making that decision. Come on up, lady. Let's give them a hand as they come today. Thank you, Lord. God bless you for coming. God bless you. You never know how the Lord's going to move in a service and, and what he's going to do. But here's the thing. You making this move today, this statement, God sees you, the angels see you. Some of you have had people in your past, in your history, aunts, uncles, grandparents that are in heaven now. They made it. They were Christians. They prayed for you probably. And right now they're watching, they're witnesses, and they see what decisions you're making and they're rejoicing. And the Bible says that People rejoice in heaven even when one person comes to the Lord. Boy, they're, they're having a party now. Because we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's a lot of people. Thank you, Lord. And we're going to rejoice with you too. And it just starts with that prayer of faith that I was talking about. We're going to pray together. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. And when you do it by faith, believing that his word is true, what he says he will do, he will do. And you may not feel any different, but when you pray that with me, that prayer of faith, it will change something in your life. Jesus will come into your heart, you'll receive him, and then you can walk out your life as a Christian and things will never be the same. You just stay on the track with him. So let's pray. You repeat after me, Father in heaven, thank you that you sent Jesus Christ. I believe that he went to the cross he died for me. He was buried and he rose on the third day. Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me for any sin in my life. This is a new day and I will serve you from here on all the days of my life. I want to be in heaven with you. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for this day giving me an opportunity to serve you in Jesus name. Amen. And you are now on your new walk with him. God bless you. Thank you guys for coming. I'm going to ask if you four would go down this direction. This, these ladies will help you, give you some information to take home with you and get some information from you so that we can send you a letter. And then if you folks would just go down here and talk to this team on your right, they'll help you out too. God bless you. Give them another hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, uh, audience, for just holding with us as we allow these people to come. It's important. Um, let me make another quick announcement for you here. We now have a date on the calendar, August 12th, Saturday, for Rick Green's Biblical Citizenship Course. It's a, what we call Biblical Citizenship Express. It's going to be done in five hours on Saturday, August 12th. And you'll get biblical knowledge uh, and learn how to apply it in your life as a good citizen. It's very important. It's Pastor Hank's desire that everyone in the church have an opportunity to go through these principles. You'll learn about the Constitution. You'll learn about Christian worldview. It'll change your thinking. It'll empower you to go out 
and make a difference in the world. So sign up for that online at uh, lohchurch.org. If you need more information, you can always go to our information center also. God bless you. See you Wednesday night for prophetic school. And then don't forget, Lance Wilno will be here Sunday. Thank you.